Hi, Igor. Привет. Привет. Добрый день. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Very good. And how are you? Yes, very good. Here in Caracas, living this COVID-19, it's really tough, but those are the challenges that we have to face. Uh, yes, exactly. And we're going to talk about them today, actually. Yes. So tell us a little bit, what's your academic background in the matter of law and where did you study it? Uh, well, uh, my background is as follows. Uh, I was born and grew up in Russia and I did my law degree in Russia and then I went to the Netherlands, to Holland, to Leiden University to study European Union law because I wanted to learn more about the system, you know, of the EU. Uh, and once I studied European Union law, uh, I then did a specialization course on intellectual property, which was uh, organized in Italy uh, by Turing University and by the World Intellectual Property Organization. And uh, after that, you know, I really wanted to specialize in intellectual property. I uh, went back to Russia and I started working in Russia as a lawyer. And I worked in some IT companies as lawyer and then I worked for some international law firms in Moscow. Uh, while I was working I was also teaching at some universities in Moscow and ten, about 10 years ago I set up my own law firm. So my own law firm, what we do, we are specialized intellectual property and information technology law firm. We do trademarks, domain names, uh, data protection, information technology and I also teach part-time. I teach part-time and this year in May actually, uh, myself and the other partner, we taught uh, at the MBA program in Moscow, intellectual property management of intellectual property. And now, you know, I, I call myself, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm a practitioner, but I'm part-time lecturer. So Perfect. here is my background more or less. Perfect. See, we know each other from Ricardo Rojas. He's from Venezuela, he studied with you. And he yeah. told me that you are very good into the intellectual property and intellectual property right now at this moment, we have to see it also very related with technology. Tell us a little bit of that. Yeah, you know, intellectual property and information technology, I would say are inseparable right now. And when you look at the development of online businesses, in particular during these times, and look at streaming services, for instance, now, when most of the people are at home, how often they watch Netflix, for instance, or use some other services, or watch some you know, bloggers on YouTube. So uh, I would say the importance of an intellectual property, online businesses, internet businesses in general, has even grown, actually, during these difficult times. And if, uh, if we talk about business in general, uh, you know that many businesses are not doing very well at the moment because of the crisis. But some businesses are doing quite well, actually. So I would say this, you know, internet-related businesses, many of them are doing quite well. And in particular, uh, you know, I also deal with domain name disputes. I'm one of the panelists for the dispute resolution bodies for the domain disputes. And uh, actually the number of disputes has increased. So there is more work for the main name disputes now. So I would say we already see the effect of the COVID-19 on these areas. I see. See, the world has changed, has been changed. And not only because of the COVID-19, it's because of the internet. So the states and the jurisdictions, we can't see it in the same way that you know that you remain in a certain state and the laws of that state also applies and only applies for those situations. We have a, a very small world right now. One, one of the, 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 the proof of that is that we're, we're talking right now, I'm in Caracas, we're in Moscow, and we're talking like, you know, we're door to door. So the relationship among people that probably they don't speak the same language, or they don't have the same culture, they have to be ruled by another kind of rules and another kind of relationships. So tell us a little bit about the challenges of privacy, the challenges about these dispute resolutions mm. among people that live in total different countries, a little bit of that. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. The world 
has become and is becoming actually you know, almost every day or every month is more international and more interconnected. Uh, I would say maybe 10 years ago, it was very difficult to say that, you know, I'm an international lawyer, because if you're a lawyer, it means that you practice in your own country, you sit in the office in Caracas, in Moscow, in New York, and you travel somewhere only for conferences. But now actually you can be in Caracas, you can be in New York, in Moscow, and you can do work, uh, you know, on different projects. You can work for clients from different countries. You can do some work which is not even related to the place where you are sitting right now. And you can deal with an online dispute where all the parties are from different countries, not even related to your country. So I would say that, you know, when we speak uh, about the main name disputes in particular, uh, very often, you know, I'm sitting at my office and I have to decide a dispute. And the complainant is from Brazil, for instance. The respondent is from Turkey. And the registrar of the domain name is in the United States. And, you know, I'm sitting somewhere else. So this is an example, I think. This is a very good example of what's going on and what has been going on for a while. And uh, I would say the good thing for, for the legal business right now is that uh, you can do your work from pretty much everywhere, as long as you have clients as long as you have experience, as long as you have reputation and network of agents, you know, in some countries. So I think this is uh, the way, you know, it's going. And with respect to privacy, because you mentioned privacy in particular, actually privacy is, is a pretty big thing right now, a pretty big concern because from the one hand, uh, you know, many countries now very, very strict and very tough privacy regulations or laws on personal data, data yet our personal data is very vulnerable right now everywhere for instance in russia we had huge cases of data breaches and these cases were related not to small businesses one of the biggest cases was related to the largest russian bank actually which leaked data of its clients and of course i mean you're aware of you know facebook and google and all the privacy concerns so this is a kind of very ironic situation uh, very tough legislation, yet so many breaches of privacy. So I would say we have to be very careful as individuals and uh, behave in a responsible way if we want to secure. It's not enough only to rely on legislation to say, okay, our country has very tough privacy rules. My privacy is protected. No, it's, it's our responsibility. Well, you mentioning relying on legislation. And I think that the idea of legislation on norms or rule in general also have to change because the states, they don't have the same time to, you know, to react to certain realities. And when seeing it at this moment with the COVID-19, that we have these emergency laws that probably they can, well, not, not probably, they're for sure in certain cases are violating uh, certain rights, privacy rights, freedom of movement, freedom of uh, communications and we see some states that they block they do they, they use a lot of blockage for, for certain pages and stuff what do you think it's important for the studying the relationship of political private rights civil rights and technology you know i think it's it's a matter of balance because we have to find the right balance between all the stakeholders all the interests from the one hand, we have the state, which has to be some kind of, you know, in control of everything which is going on. And as you rightly said, you know, state is not so fast anymore. From the other hand, we have big corporations like Google, like Facebook, and uh, they're also making money on data. It's part of their businesses. From, and then again, we have, you know, data subjects, individuals, we have, you know, ourselves. And uh, it's not very easy to find the right balance, especially you know, in the, as you mentioned, uh, COVID-19, the emergency situation, where our privacy, uh, obviously the government, the state said, we have to protect your health. But then again, how we're doing it, we're doing it at the expense of your privacy. So we have to control, you have to, like what happened in, in Russia, for instance, in some cities in Russia, uh, I think in Moscow, it was a rule that if you want to, at certain times, get out of your place, you had to send an SMS and get a QR code. And if you're stopped by the police, then you show your mobile phone and then they can read the QR code. So basically, you're already giving in your privacy. 
then if you fly to a certain country, you have to fill in a questionnaire with all your personal data information. When you, uh, like uh, some of my clients told me recently, they went to a pub in Germany to drink beer. And before drinking, they had to fill in a questionnaire with a name and phone number, just in case, you know, COVID happens, they can be reached out. So we're giving away our privacy more often now. And, you know, again, we're talking about balance. Is there right balance? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Well, I was studying a little bit the case of Singapore, that they developed this application that was only connected through Bluetooth. So it doesn't have, you know, exactly where you are sitting in this moment, particularly, and some stuff. And you are, you know, it's, it's your own choice if you public your, 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 your data, your personal data. So do you think it's a good idea or a good moment to develop these technologies using not probably the, the, the general communication like, you know, Wi-Fi and stuff, but, but more reliable or more private uh, towards privacy? I think it's, it's a good idea in general, reliance on technology, but then again, it cannot be applied to all the countries because I mean, Singapore is a relatively small country and it's very technologically developed country. Not every country is so developed. You know, some countries are bigger, <laughs> larger, like Russia is a huge country. And uh, it's very difficult to implement the same, you know, measures if you have such a huge country. I'm not even speaking about Russia. I mean, let's, let's talk about Germany or France or Argentina or Brazil, for instance. These are big countries as well. So I think this approach is good, but it will probably work only in some small and very, very technologically developed countries, but it will not work in some, in some other countries, unfortunately. Well, we'll see the, 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 the example of China. China is very big and we are really concerned how this privacy probably doesn't exist at all because they have the cameras and they have this uh, point uh, system of you know civil and, and social contract stuff. So, how do you think our culture, our legal culture, will you know, match these uh, technologies? How different it will be, not because of the size of the countries, but be because of our natural culture? Uh, yes, but you know, it's a very, very country-specific situation, I would say. It has to do with mentality, with history, with the traditions of a particular country. Of course, I mean, all the states now try to follow some sort of a universal approach. So we are not longer isolated from each other. Even Russia, I mean, Russia, as we, we said, it's a big country, it has its own traditions, but Russia follows examples of, of the European Union sometimes, even of the United States. Uh, but again, I think, I think it's, 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 it's really hard, you know, to find one universal approach that would fit all. It's, uh, when we're talking about, you know, law and technology and how to, to reconcile them together, it all comes down to a specific situation in a, in a specific country in a specific moment of time. And uh, I, th I think it depends on the political context as well. So. Well, the political context at this moment is really important because all governments try to get used to the idea of uh, emergency in order to implement their, their measures. Some measures could be you know, understood by the general populations, another one will not. So it, it is tough. It is, it is going to be a tough situation probably during the next months. But society doesn't stop and the world doesn't stop. So we have to, to help and deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I think we as lawyers, as legal professionals, as legal scholars, it's an obligation to educate people, maybe to promote these ideas and also to talk about, you know, fundamental rights and freedoms. Even though we have some kind of an emergency situation, I think we have to keep reminding people that, you know, we still have the rights and freedoms. We have constitutional rights. We have constitutions because all the constitutions, you know, they still exist. And even though we can talk about certain kinds of restrictions, I mean, these restrictions, they have to be proportionate. They have to be adequate. And again, uh, we have to push these uh, issues forward, I think. It's, 
it's our obligation. So that's one of the ideas maybe for this debate uh, and for similar debates. Well, my fear or my main fear with this situation is that the states and the governments will try to remain in that situation of emergency in order to justify some infringement of some laws and they will say, oh, and some person rights and they will tell you, well, we'll see, uh, we're doing it for your own good, for public safety and for public health. And we'll see that sometimes it's not because of that. It's because they have to remain in power and they'll use whatever mean they have to do so. And that's another question that I want to tell you. Law students, or general students, not because of the student of law. What do you think we have to teach them as a professor of fundamental rights or constitutional rights or technology, how to understand constitutional law and fundamental rights with education during century, 21st century and COVID-19 times? You know, I think in every kind of education, it's always important to make a connection between theory and practice. So uh, the way, let's say, I'm trying to teach my students is to give them real life examples and to explain to them how this is going to affect their life, their everyday life, their business, uh, business of their employ employers, and so on and so forth. So with respect to constitutional rights, uh, I mean, we have many rights, freedom of movement, for instance. This is one of the rights which is restricted right now. We also have uh, freedom of, of employment or freedom of use uh, of our, let's say, talents for entrepreneurial activity. And this is also restricted in certain ways because some businesses are closed right now. They cannot function, you know, in this emergency situation in different countries. So I think uh, our obligation is to explain, you know, what's going on right now, how it is affecting our fundamental rights and freedoms and how our fundamental rights and freedoms are actually connected with our everyday life, with our income, with, you know, with our ability to make money, to feed our family, you know, and to grow as a person, you know, as an employee, as a lawyer, as a university professor, because, uh, I mean, we can imagine that some of the activities have been restricted and some of them are impossible. And again, this is all so related. Yes, it is. See, there is a phenomenon that I would like to talk to you a little bit. It is Bitcoin. Not only because of the idea of money or value, but because of the, of the code and the, and, the, and the privacy behind the, the, all the system. It will help, you know, to face governments and big corporations. So civil society and global civil society can rely at this moment with this technology that give you privacy and it give you certainty of transactions. What are your, your, your thoughts about this technology? You know, to be honest, uh, I cannot call myself a Bitcoin enthusiast. I think that it's an interesting technology it has a future, but uh, for me, it's too early to judge, you know, to say that, you know, Bitcoin will save the world, especially right now, you know, in this unstable situation. I would say it certainly has a future. I also see some attempts from the government to regulate, you know, Bitcoin, because in Russia, uh, first they tried to prohibit Bitcoins at all. Then they said, okay, we can recognize Bitcoin as a means of payment in certain transactions, as a means of uh, paying it charter capital when you form a company uh, they, but you know they haven't decided yet so I would say I I mean for me personally uh, I would say it's too early to say it certainly has a potential but I would say it all comes down again to regulation and uh, we can say that you know Bitcoin is independent it allows individuals to conduct transactions without the government but is are the government going to allow this and for how long and that you know, can be, can be one, of the, one, one of the most difficult, you know, issues to tackle. But one thing is for sure, it is a phenomenon because it deals with one of the more, most important things of states, if creating the idea of money and how do you transact. So you can, you know, control, if you don't control that very specific part, 
you'll see that the states and the government will be, you know, lacking of one of the, the most powerful tool they have. And, and, yeah. I, and I see not only because of the idea of money, but also because of the idea of data, that you can have it distributed, you don't have it centralized, and you can, you know, put it in some servers outside your own country. So you have some, some idea of contracts or documents or even the, the personal ID uh, files. So mm -hmm. the, the, the concept of sovereignty, it changes also. Yes, I agree, absolutely. Change, it's definitely a phenomenon. Uh, but again, uh, I mean, I would, uh, why, why I'm so cautious, let's say, and why I'm not, let's say, 100% optimistic about that, because, I mean, we've seen similar things with the rise of the internet in general, because when internet, you know, developed, when internet became a commercial thing, a popular thing, not just, you know, for US government, you know, for some military purposes, as was initial idea of the internet. We all believe that, you know, now we have complete freedom of information. You know, we can download, upload everything. We had Napster first. We can distribute music. But then again, you know, business intervened, corporations intervened, uh, state intervened. There are attempts to, as you mentioned already, to block certain content on various, uh, on various grounds. Uh, because you may say this content is extremist. This promotes terrorism. This is content which is infringing intellectual property right. This is, you know, hate speech, whatever. But maybe this is just criticism of the government. And I mean, we've seen this in Russia. In Russia, lots of websites are actually banned and blocked uh, physically. You cannot access certain websites if you, if you go to Russia. So well, we will those, see. With those are the challenges of the law. And in, uh, has in theory and in practice, we'll, we'll see how it impacts also the theory, it's not only a, a regular uh, evaluation, it, it, it affects the theory and the practice. Another theme that I want to talk to you is about dispute re re resolutions. Dispute resolutions in general, and then I would like to talk a little bit during this pandemic, this uh, COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. You know, in general, dispute resolution, uh, again, in my experience, uh, I, and I, again, I can talk about my area of practice, you know, intellectual property. Certainly in Russia, there are more inter uh, intellectual property disputes. There have been more for the last five years because businesses now understand they need to protect the intellectual property. They are ready to go to courts. They have, let's say, more trust in courts now than they had 10, 15 years ago. Uh, with regard to the main name disputes, uh, all these uh, international so-called domain disputes are going online. They've been always going online. And uh, there is an increase of online disputes. It's very efficient. You don't have to travel anywhere. You don't pay travel costs or whatever. So there is an increase of uh, disputes, uh, you know, the main name disputes. And uh, the recent trends, obviously, because of the, you know, this current situation, we had some online court hearings. And probably the future is also not just, you know, uh, alternative dispute resolution services, but also conducting, you know, traditional state court hearings online in some cases and in some jurisdictions. I think this can be the future and maybe we can talk about it more if you... Maybe. You, you are a law practitioner, a practitioner and in Russia you go to court. Can you tell us a little bit how the court system and the judicial system works it's, uh, I mean, without the use of uh, these technologies, if it's regular, like a court that you go and file some papers and then the, the, the victims go and go testimony and stuff, and how could be affected with the use of these technologies? Well, now you can file electronically, actually in commercial courts in Russia, then you have to submit all documents on paper, but at least initially you can file and it was possible even before COVID-19. Right. And actually this also applies to some other filings, not just court filings, but you know, to some file, for instance, trademark applications, you can be filed online. Uh, and then use of technologies, you can use information from the internet, 
in court proceedings. It's more acceptable in Russia. It's been more acceptable for the last, I would say, maybe 10 years before, because I can tell you before, maybe early 2000, when you try to print so out something from the internet and show it to a judge, then the judge would you know, freak out, say, what, what is this? We need to have you know, paper with a stamp, you know, something mm -hmm. you know, physical, something tangible. You printed out something from somewhere and I don't understand what it's all about. And then they decided to notarize you know, the websites. So notarization of websites has become a very popular procedure. It is still popular now, but recently our Supreme Court said that you can now print out screenshots you know, from websites and it can be accepted as evidence in court proceedings. It was before COVID-19 again, so it kind of developing. I'm doing some research, some recent research for a, for a presentation I have in a couple of weeks about the electronic and digital file. Because even though we have it a PDF or a print or whatever mean to, to interpret what we were writing, we, in, my, in our minds, we have the, the file, the same file, like the book and the seal and the signature. And all these technologies, even though we're, we're having it unmaterialized, we even try to reproduce what we have in real life. Instead of changing our culture in that it's not necessarily sometimes anymore that material interpretation of the, the paper. Have you ever have those thoughts of changing our culture that is not ne necessary to have this file has a reproduction of the regular or traditional one? Well, you know, I've been thinking about that. And again, here, maybe I can get to this online disputes, the main name dispute resolution services, because I'm one of the panelists. So actually, I'm the one who also decides the disputes, kind mm -hmm. of a judge. And uh, in this online dispute resolution proceedings, you know, the proceedings are very informal. So you submit documents in some electronic form, but there, is, there are no strict requirements like a PDF or JPEG or whatever. It has to be a stamp, you know, notarized. Or... So I think uh, after dealing with these disputes and seeing how informal, you know, the rules for electronic evidence is, I would like to have something similar in Russia but uh, I mean, the problem with Russia, again, and I, I'm going to say it again, you know, Russia is a huge country, but probably because, because it's so huge, it takes so much time to change something and to implement the changes. Probably it has to do something with mentality as well and with the, you know, with the communist traditions the legacy of the USSR. But uh, I would say that even the recent changes are still positive. I agree with you that it would be good, you know, maybe to have a different understanding or maybe a different mindset of what evidence is. And we don't have to have a proper, you know, electronic document in a PDF format to consider it evidence. But again, I think we'll get to that. But, you know, matter of time, how, how, how long it will. But we have to work on that. I don't know if it happens to you. I, I sometimes talk with this uh, evidence law professors and they have their mind into the document, into the seal, into the importance of the instrument itself more than its it contents. And the content is data. And the data is everywhere. So right now, this file that contains our conversation is data that I'm yeah. going to download it and upload it and send it to you and, and, and stuff. And it doesn't have to be materialized in certain ways. So it is tough to face some, you know, really renowned professors on uh, evidence law and try to get them into this new digital thought, let's name it that way, digital, decentralized, and new kind of thoughts and culture. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely agree with you. It's absolutely the same, the same issue here in Ru and in some other countries in Europe as well. I mean, it's not just Russia, you know, I'm saying Russia, it's, it's pretty much in many countries, pretty much the same as you, I mean, you nicely said it, that they look at the form, not the content. They look whether the stamp is there or two stamps or something else, but they don't actually look what is written there. Uh, is it related to the dispute? Uh, does it prove anything? Uh, and uh, again, we have these issues in Russian courts from time to time. Judges are becoming more flexible. 
but not as flexible as we want them to be. One of the ways, uh, again, is to educate younger generation. Uh, that's what I'm kind of trying to do. I recently started some informal live webinars for, for law students and for young lawyers where I'm talking about domain name disputes, international domain name disputes, including, you know, uh, standard of proof uh, requirements for the evidence, less formalities, look at the substance. So I'm kind of hoping that maybe I can give my very small contribution, but just to explain to this, you know, young lawyers who may become judges after maybe 10 years that you know we shouldn't really do the same traditional way and if you have some material that you can share with us i'll be happy to have it and i'll be happy to promote it and well yeah. if it's necessary to translate it into spanish we'll do that we'll do that because those are general ideas we'll see that we're coming from different legal cultures and we'll see how we have some some same ideas and same approaches to, toward these situations. About culture, legal culture, how do you think it will be affected with this COVID-19 um, situation we're, we're getting through? I think lawyers, I mean, I'm now talking about lawyers in general, you know, in a very broad sense of the world. Uh, in my, in my view and in my recent experience, they have to become more flexible, more business oriented and kind of better know the client's needs. Uh, because before COVID-19, I'm talking about, you know, traditional law firms. Many lawyers are doing quite well. You go to your office every day, you do your job from nine to, to six, you get a good salary if you work in a good firm. You don't really care so much about, you know, some other stuff. But now when some of the clients have financial troubles, when they're very picky, when they care about money and they care about advice they, they're getting from lawyers, I, I think, it, and it's, it's my idea in general that very often lawyers, every, pretty much everywhere, I mean, in some countries it's better, in the other countries it's maybe worse, uh, they lack understanding of business, really what business needs. I mean, we know how to draft memos, how to talk to the other lawyers, we use the same language, but how to talk to businesses, I mean, that's very often we don't know. And very often, I mean, if you go to a legal conference with 200, 500 thousand of lawyers, I mean, we all talk to each, other, to each other nicely, but it's not always easy for, for a non-lawyer to get into the conference and have a good time because he or she will be bored probably. They, you know, yeah. it's just boring because, I mean, you're talking about some stuff which is not related to my, my job, my business. So I think we have to become more flexible, more business oriented in general, everywhere. And we'll see many times that the clients, they'll see the lawyers and the law practice, how they are stopping the business. So very parts of the, or very important parts of the business can get, you know, re, uh, retarded, can be laded, they can be, you know, stopped by this legal opinions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. That's what we are, as lawyers, we are very good at stopping businesses because we always find risks. And I mean, that's understandable because yes, we have to show them the risks, but we also have to show them the solutions and maybe some ways to minimize the risk. I'm not saying to avoid because very often you cannot avoid the risk at all. In many cases, there is always going to be a risk. But at least you can say, if you do this, then the risks uh, will be smaller. So I think this is, let's say, something which we have to all do. And this is something, uh, again, that kind of all law lawyers are struggling with. In my opinion, it's pretty universal. I mean, you're saying also the same things which I've experienced you know, in, in my practice and we're in, on different continents. And uh, I say, yes, becoming more flexible, more business oriented, and you know, looking for opportunities is very important also. Because as we know, every challenge is an opportunity. So let's try to find opportunities in this difficult time. What are your thoughts about the legal tech, technology directly applied for legal services? Not mm -hmm. for the client, but, but for the lawyers. And what experiences have you had in, in Russia about it? You know, legal tech is, is a hot topic right now everywhere. Again, it's a pretty universal thing. And obviously its importance is going to grow 
because I mean, no lawyer right now can function without some kind of technology. Even, I mean, even without Skype or Zoom or email, I can hardly imagine some even very, very old lawyer. Uh, you cannot function without that. But then again, it depends. I think the legal tech, uh, I mean, problems which I had sometimes with all the legal tech tools, that some of them are kind of remotely related to legal business. And it's, again, they kind of lack understanding of what legal business needs. So ideally, it would be good to have some kind of merger between the legal tech and the technology companies which provide these tools and services to lawyers and the lawyers' real needs. So once we you know, have the complete merger, uh, it's, it's going to be fine. But uh, obviously, you cannot function now without technology. You cannot rely on technology alone. That's, you know, again, from a trademark practitioner's perspective, very often we... Uh, we get the search results, you know, for similar trademarks done by some machines, some, you know, technology services, and they are not always reliable. You have to really go through them and spend hours and hours. So human intervention, again, is necessary. You're mentioning human intervention. You're mentioning the, 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 the technologies. And there is another aspect really important right now, artificial intelligence and dispute resolutions. I'll imagine that also in Russia, you'll have these discussions daily, on daily basis, about how far can, be, can we accept that someone different than the human thoughts and the human nature will deal with dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with regard to dispute resolution, the way I see it now, I think that you know, artificial intelligence can certainly play some role in dispute resolution services. But, you know, I cannot imagine at this stage or at some near, near future that, you know, AI will be playing a very, very serious role. Because as I mentioned, uh, you know, human intervention is still necessary. You can do certain work, maybe some preliminary work, some, some routine work with the, with the help of artificial intelligence. And I mean, we have some kind of robot lawyers already, robots. Lawyers, we call them legal robots, whatever. They 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 actually working already in Russia, and there are you know some people saying that you know they'll, let's say they will substitute you know all the lawyers, so there will be no need in lawyers in some future, or at least you know in some services. I'm not sure. I mean, they can substitute certain type of legal services, maybe certain type of you know work, but I. Personally, uh, I do not believe that, you know, lawyers, you know, will lose their they role because of AI. Well, probably the traditional lawyer that tried to deal with the same traditional processes. <clears throat> and this, all technologies and robot and inter artificial intelligence are mere instruments. Instruments that we can rely on them to get better, the better job, but not, it's not a substitute of the, of the regular lawyer. Of course, new students, new lawyers, they have to intervene, but they have to, they, they have to study these phenomena. Another thing, I don't know how the legal education is in, in, in Russia, but here in Venezuela, we're having these difficult times, and a lot of students, they try to quit stop studying uh, law. Many of the, the, their parents, they tell them, why do you study law? See, this is going to be... A, a, a profession that is going to be relied by another technologies and stuff. What are your recommendations to these young people that want to study law and they see many things against that will? You see, my recommendation, and it's, it's pretty universal to, to everyone, whether you're in Venezuela, in Russia, in the United States, in Ukraine, in China, uh, if you want to study law, you really... You, you, you have to love it, you have to like it, at least. You have to have some sort of passion. Don't go and study just because, you know, your parents tell you or someone else tells you or you watch, you know, some TV series about lawyers and you think, oh, it's cool, they all look cool, they all make good money. Uh, just because somebody is telling you that, you know, law is, is a good profession, just don't, don't do that because uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to fail in the end. And I've seen so many failures of people who went to study law because of their parents, because of their relatives, because it was cool, because they wanted to make money. 
you have to study anything if you like it. So that's, that's a universal recipe. And I mean, you don't have to know the specifics because when you're young, you don't know what you're going to do in five or six years, obviously. You don't have to have a complete picture, but at least you have to kind of, uh, you have to have a desire to learn it, to maybe understand, to apply it in real life. And it can be a very vague idea, but there has to be something inside you. So my idea is just, my recommendation, try to find something inside you that connects you to the law. If you don't find it, try something else, I would say. Since I had these conversations, what I liked is I talk with a lot of people that's the same than me in love with law. I'm in law. I'm, well, my father was a lawyer and automatically um, since I met, you know, the, the, the office and the stuff, I fell in love with law and all behind it, you know, besides the, the idea of justice and the stuff. It's a way of thinking. And I think our contribution to the society, it is more important than a lot of people will see. And that's what I try to communicate to the students. Oh, yes, yes. See, I would like all to, to, to end this nice conversation and we'll see, and I know we'll have another ones to come. Your thoughts during these tough times, COVID-19, and how can we face it? Um, your recommendation for everyone that sees this program. You know, my general recommendations, try as much as you can. I mean, we're all in different circumstances. And, you know, it, it's hard to give, in that case, it's hard to give universal advice to everyone, you know, who is, who is going to listen, who is going to watch this. But I would say try to be mentally and physically fit as much as you can. Uh, try to do your regular daily activities, read, do something which you like, which you love do some exercises, some, some you know, physical activities, and try to follow your passion if you don't have enough work at the moment. I mean, maybe you, you lost your job. Uh, don't you know, be so, too depressed because that happened, that happened to some experienced people I know, some experienced lawyers. It's not a nice thing you know, to happen to you, but then again, it's not the end. It, it's practically never the end of the world. Uh, I mean, positive mindset, mindset sounds like a cliche. I mean, we all hear about positive, positive, but I, I mean, there is nothing else you can really do, I think. Just be positive and believe, you know, in better life and better future and use this as an opportunity. Again, we, we spoke about that, you know, every crisis is an opportunity, every challenge is an opportunity. If you have some extra time now, I mean, there are lots of free courses right now. You can try to learn some language, you can, listen to some podcasts, you can listen to how conversation, to some other conversations. You can try to network to some people, to reach out to people. If you listen to some podcasts and if you're a lawyer, but you lost your job, you can maybe contact these people, find them on LinkedIn, find their websites and just ask for you know, a piece of advice maybe for recommendation. I would say it's really hard now to network, you know, to talk to people, you cannot travel. And not everybody, you know, is talking like, like me and you on podcasts, but try to reach out to other people by networks, uh, by, uh, by watching webinars and then contacting these people. Try to be active because, yes, maybe many people will not respond, but I would say one, two or three will. And maybe this one or two or three responses, they may change your life, actually. So be positive, be active and try to change. If you're in a bad situation, try to change this situation. So that's Yes, those are tough times, really tough times. I was studying like several uh, situations like this in humanity, like the black past and stuff. And we have this technology that can help us to, to, to redirect our, our means and our situation. Like you're saying, try to learn another language. There are hundreds of courses and hundreds of activities that can you know, make a change in your life, probably for worse, for better. But the thing is, don't remain in that situation. Try to move another thing. Try to, to see another perspective of life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there are many opportunities now, even in terms of networking. I mean, to be honest, I can tell you from my perspective, I'm, I'm very busy now. I'm busy with my work, but I'm also busy you know, talking to other people, speaking at conferences, at 
virtual conferences. Actually, I will be speaking next Tuesday in Brazil, but I will not be in Brazil, of course. There will be an international conference organized in Sao Paulo. So I was invited to speak there about personal data. So there are lots of opportunities. And then there are lot, many of these conferences are free. So you can go there, you can listen to all these presentations, you can contact all these speakers, they may be 40, 50, 60 speakers, maybe meet some other people. So just, as you said, try to use every opportunity which is available right now. Yes, it is. I'm also doing so. I'm doing, I'm doing and receiving some conferences and some speeches and lectures. And well, we keep on moving. Definitely. Igor, I'm really, really happy to talk to you. And I know that this is going to be the first of many activities probably we'll have soon this month, this coming months and this coming weeks. And if you have any material that you want to share with us, feel free to do so. And um, we'll keep in touch. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversation and I will be happy, you know, maybe to have another one. And yes, we will. I will send you, you know, the materials which we have, in, which I think can be maybe useful for you and stay in touch. How do you say goodbye in Russian? Uh, do svidania. Do svidania. Do svidania, yeah. Do svidania. Do svidania, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.